open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We're in the 11th chapter of Hebrews looking at uh, the faith cycle. This is our second lesson. I was originally going to call this living by faith. And John encouraged me to call it faith cycle so that on the internet, we could put it in a specific category. And so I changed it to the faith cycle rather than living by faith as far as the series title. I want to show you something that's of, of great interest, at least to me. Uh, he introduces the idea of what we refer to as the faith cycle. And I explained that the Greek grammar to you in verse 1 last week. And for those who are visiting with us by the Internet, uh, to go back and pick that up would be really important to where we're going with our study so that you understand that the writer is not giving you a definition of faith in verse 1. He's giving you the mechanics of it. Now, in verse 2, he introduces the men of the old covenant. Uh, and in verse two, for by it, the men of old gained approval. Now that word gained appro appro approval is really interesting because the word that's used is matarero. M-A-R-T-U-R-E-O, Maturero. And that's the word for witness or testimony. And that's the literal meaning of the word Maturero. So what the, what the translators did is they went to, rather than give you the meaning of the word, they went to the application of it. <clears throat> and... All the translators out of the, the Greek into the English did something similar. And so I showed you, for example, the New American Standard called it gained approval. Um, the N NIV called it commended for. I, I don't I looked at a lot of different translations. Uh, the King James. Um, the King James. I wrote it down somewhere on your paper. I forget. They, they, oh, they called it obtained a good report. Obtained a good report. So, but the word materero, literally in the Greek language, the literal translation, translation is witness or testimony. And so what the writers did is they went to the application side or from verse 1. That's why I spent a whole hour on verse 1 just to get to verse 2. You need to really understand what they were talking about mechanics, so they went to the mechanical side of the definition rather than the literal side. You understand that? This word gained approval is... <laughs> Is an application side, not a literal side to the word. Materero is the word that's used. Now, let me show you. And so they now they in in verse uh, three, by faith, they begin the by faith series. In verse four, and and I explained how important that was. They started with creation. And I explained why they did that out of the uh, understanding verse one last week. <coughs> Now, what they did in verse 4 is they began to talk about people. And this runs through, verse, it starts in verse 4, and it runs through verse 38. Actually, actually, it runs through verse 30, I guess 32. You could say verse 32. They stopped naming people in verse 32. 
they start naming people in verse 4, and they go through 32 naming people. And in verse 32, they lump a whole bunch together. They, they say, like in verse 32, uh, and what shall I say? For time will fail me if I, if I tell you more, like Gideon, Barak, and then he goes through a list, okay? Uh, I think there's a list of seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, including by calling the prophets, you know, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc. Now, he comes back to this, verse 2, he comes back to this idea in verse 39. So drop all the way down to 39 because he comes back to verse 32. So everything from verse 2 to verse 38 through uh, down to 39 or the end of the chapter, you're going to see this thing. Now he stops mentioning people in verse 32. Agreed? Why if you look through it? I mean, what it is. Then in verse 39, he's about to close at 39 and 40. He closes the chapter. Agreed? All right. Look in verse 32. He uses the same word, gain, having gained approval. Having gained approval. Having gained approval. And it's Monterero. So what he's done is he's gone into the old covenant and laid out an argument for the faith cycle of people who lived it as a lifestyle. They were people who reached spiritual maturity and found out that in every stage of your growth, baby, you need a faith cycle. You don't advance. In mature stage, if you don't use the faith cycle, you don't advance. When you hit maturity, this is what you don't, you're not going to be able to maintain unless you do the faith cycle. The faith cycle, once you hit maturity, will wind up in super grace like we, we talked last night uh, in the life of Joseph, where you can see, when, couldn't you not see super grace in the most magnificent way last night? I mean, it just, that example in there on, you know, I hear people go like, well, super grace, where did you come up with that stupid idea? Well, last night, if you want to know anything about super grace, go back and pick up our lesson that we did last night because this is clear as a bell. And, uh, but anyhow, so in verse 39, he wraps this up. Now we're wrapping this whole thing of, of chapter 11 up. And he says, all these having gained approval through their faith. That's the faith cycle. And, but gained approval, say, so what he's talking about is the application of the faith cycle in a believer's life consistently, the impact it has on the world. These all men were on world stage, right? I mean, these are, these are the stained glass people of the old covenant, right? And, and listen, he didn't, he just went through, so he just went through and picked out some people that were landmark kind of people that understood how important the faith cycle was, and the writer's trying to show how important the faith cycle is to every dispensation, whether it's, whether it's and he's going to do this by the people he lists. He's going to show, it doesn't matter if it's the Gentile age or the Jewish age or the church age or whatever age, as long as, you're, as long as you're operating the plan of God, faith cycle has to work. That's what moves the whole thing along. So this is kind of an interesting study out of Hebrews 11 for you, uh, in my opinion, about it. And so it's kind of interesting how the writers took liberty here, but their liberty is explained by the way they discuss Hebrews 11.1 1 in the application to life. And how, how the faith cycle gained approval by moving the plan of God forward uh, in human history. And approval before God. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. But by fulfilling, you know, faith comes by hearing, 
And then the application of the hearing is believing and bringing it out into your personal life. It pushes the plan of God forward in the world. And all these guys were guys who, but the gain, gained approval is it connected to their life of faith with God. Pushing the plan of God forward. And listen, every time you, every time the faith circle works in your life, every time the faith cycle works in your life, is pushing, listen, it's pushing the plan of God forward in the world. Just think about that. Every time. I don't know what I, my little old life could do. Well, if you live by faith, it'll push the plan of God forward in the world. That's what it'll do. That's a magnificent idea. So, uh, the writer comes in in verse two, and he and he and he and and he, and he you know it's like bookends. You've got verse two, and you got verse thirty-nine and forty. And so I wanted to be sure that you can see that uh, with some clarity. Let's have a word of prayer, and then I'll get into our study tonight. We're going to look at five aspects of gaining approval as uh, contained in the in Hebrews eleven. Actually, actually, you'll see tonight that not only does it contain it in Hebrews 11, but it also in 12.1, Hebrews 12.1. Uh, Hebrews 12.1, a lot of people don't understand Hebrews 12.1 because they don't read Hebrews 12.11, uh, 11, so they don't understand it. But, but anyhow, let's have a word for them. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin a desire to satisfy and gratify the flesh rather than the spirit who lives in the Christian life? How do I regain from, how do I move from carnality back to spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit? You confess your sin. The work of Christ on the cross is extended to the Christian life through cleansing. So 1 John 1, 9 says, when we confess our sins, personal sin, could be mental attitude type of sins. It could be sins of the tongue or verse sins, to give you an example. But when the Holy Spirit makes aware, you aware of it, then your responsibility of your priesthood is to confess it in order to be spiritual. And so 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, God, the Lord, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And that puts us back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality. A very important thing, and I say to you who are with, visiting with us by the Internet, this applies to you as if you were sitting right here in our presence. So you need to take a moment, bow your head, close your eyes, and do a little church business, do a little priesthood business with the Lord. So our Father, we thank you tonight for these who have worked a, 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 a worthy day. Have, been a, have borne a testimony before the world of the presence of Christ in their life and understand the importance of putting their feet under the table of the word of God to feed upon their souls so that they can tomorrow go back and be that confident witness for Christ. And I'm thankful for that and for those who are not able to come by automobile but have the positive attitude about hearing the word of God, believing the word of God and applying it to their life as well and have picked us up. I pray they would not let interruptions of their household distract them from the Bible study in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight I want to look at five aspects of the concept that the writer gave on gaining approval, uh, the Monterero idea of application. What is really important to see the consistency of the writer with this word Monterero. In verse 2, as I mentioned in my introduction, he, he gives it. Uh, it is the word witness or testimony. A translated gained approval by what we're about to read from verse 3 uh, all the way to the, verse 40. Uh, gained approval, Monterero is used as an aorist passive indicative 
in verse 2. It runs all the way down in application to verse 39 and 40. In verse 39, the writer says, All of those... What's he talking about? All of those. Everybody from verse 4 that had names and history behind it have gained approval. He puts it in heiress, passive, participle, nominative, plural, masculine. He's kept consistent in the heiress tense of history, biblical history of the faith cycle. All those who've gained approval through their faith, faith Faith application, which is the whole story of these people. We call it the faith cycle. Listen to this. Did not receive what was promised. They bore witness to the world of the plan of God in Christ. It never got what was promised. Now think about that. You go, I wonder what that was. Well, we'll tell you in a minute. This same idea is carried over to the 12th chapter of Hebrews, verse 1. Therefore, since we, new covenant believers, who live by the faith cycle, have so great a cloud of witnesses, old covenant believers who live by the faith cycle, which were described to us in great detail in Hebrews 11. The word witnesses is martis, which is the noun form of the verb. This is the word martis is where you get the word martyr. These were people who had committed their life to Christ that were willing to die for him. You know, you're not willing to live for him. You're sure not going to be willing to die for him. But once you begin to live for him in a pattern of life, when the time comes, you'll be ready to die for him. And so they're given that kind of, what did, here's what verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1 says, what have we, what have we learned from those that have brought the plan of God to us generationally. What can we singly, what single doctrine could we learn as we are now new covenant people in the church age? What could we possibly learn? What key doctrine would these people want to give us? What testimony, what witness, what would they testify to us was a key? You know what it was? Faith cycle. Just what he said. He said, therefore, conclusion of verse 39 and 40, which is the whole discussion of Hebrews 11. Since we, church age believers, have such, so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Materero, for these people we've talked about here, the super grace believers, the people who have lived their life in such a way that they are ready not only to live for Christ, but to die for him. These super grace believers who have borne witness for Christ in the world under some extreme conditions, you see, is what the writer is trying to tell us. Materere is used in some form in this series of three passages, verse 2, 39, and 12, 1, to show the importance of the faith cycle to every dispensation and both covenants, the old covenant and the new. Paul had this idea in Romans 14, 8. Listen to what Paul says. Just listen, you'll know it. Listen to what he says. He says, if we live, if we live, he's talking about Christians, new covenant believers, if we live, how do we live? 
We live for, we live for Christ. If we live, we live for Christ. Now, let me tell you, we live for a lot of things, but the most important thing you live for is Christ. He should be at the top of your list, not the bottom. And he means to live for him. Then he says, if we die, what do we do? We die for Christ. Therefore, he says, whether we live or die, it's all about Christ. When you get to heaven, it won't, because of all, it won't be about all about you. You're going to get to heaven because it's all about Christ or you don't get there. So your life ought to be lived in such a way. You ought to learn that before you die. If we live, our life is all about Christ. If we die, it's all about Christ. So whether we live or die, it's all about Christ. And that's the choice you make. You make it every day. Because you live every day. Point number two, the Greek word for old men. This is really interesting because there's a definite article with it. Boy, boy, mates. There's a definite article with it. There's a definite article with it, and the word is presbuteros. Who would have ever guessed that? Well, the clue is old men. But when you read, now, now listen to me. Now, when you read the list of people from verse 4 all the way to the end of the chapter, there are women. Sarah's mentioned, Rahab's mentioned, and the word women is mentioned. Press Bruderos, press Bruderos, means elder, but doesn't always mean men. And this is a good example of it, isn't it? And these are not elder based on ages. It's based on maturity. It's spiritual maturity. These are the people that have lived long enough in the presence of Christ in this world to have the wisdom of God displayed to the world through their life. Joseph did it. Everywhere Joseph went, the wisdom of God was displayed. Pharaoh was overwhelmed by his divine wisdom. He was overwhelmed by it. All of the all of the wise people of e Egypt, and they, they had more books in the library. They wrote more books than we've got. None of them had the wisdom of Joseph. And Joseph knew that it wasn't his, it was God's. Do you know that? Listen, when you have the wisdom of God, other people will listen to it. Now, they may not like it, and they may not obey it, and they may push it back in your face, but they'll give it a hearing because they've never heard anything like it. I was one of those guys. I never heard anything like it. Divine truth is a magnificent thing. I mean, when Paul said it will set you free, it sure does. It sets you free from the cosmic system of lies because the word of God is built on truth, not lies. It's a powerful idea. So, presbuteros normally is translated elder. But in Hebrews 11, presbuteros is used both with men and women. And it's not talking about old men. He's talking about the, word, the idea of old is old covenant. But the word old is not translated in the Greek here. And neither is men, 
but rather it is the Greek word presbyteros, which is normally translated elder. Now, it could, be, it could refer to old men, but the passage would make it clear. They would say, well, he was an old man. He lived to be 175 years old, and he was an old man, uh, yet, yet uh, with great vigor in his soul. Presbyteros could be a word that could be used to describe a very old man. But here, we don't have that. We have people of all kinds of ages, and, 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 it's, not, and it's not used just with men. It's used with a specific group of people. I find that to be really interesting. These were spiritual mature believers living the faith cycle. The, Hebrew, the Hebrews 11.1. 1. As a normal lifestyle. Living it as a normal lifestyle. And as a result, we're witnesses of the light of Christ in the world. Like in Matthew 5.14. Or Ephesians 5.8. For we were formerly darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. That's who they were. And they were that walking. You know what that word walking, peripateo, this word walking in 5.8, is a present active imperative, second person plural. That's a command. That, that's a hut to, that's not a hut to. This is a constant, a present co continuous action command. You know, what the world needs most, it is love, but listen, it is the light that brings them there. The love of God sent his son to die on the cross. That's the light. When the spotlight hits it, those who receive it experience the love of God, and those who don't can only witness it. But the light, Christ says, I'm the light. When he dies on the cross, when he's nailed to the cross, he's the light. There's a light around him. When he dies on that cross, it's for the sins. There's darkness. And God did that, didn't he? What did he do? He shut the lights out. He put the light on him on the cross and then shut it off when he died for the sins. Right? Gosh, you know that. If you haven't, go back and read the end of the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It tells you that story. It's a marvelous idea. We are that light. We're to be that light. We walk as children of the light. And it, when it does, it focuses on the plan of God and who he is and why he's important in life. Agreed? Yeah. And how do we make that walk work? We do it by faith. That's what I'm getting from this. Or, or in Galatians 2.20. Listen to this. I have been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. It's a perfect passive indicative. You know what the perfect tense means? It means completed in the past results. It remains completed in the present and forever. I have been crucified. When did that occur in your life in the past? And now it's a done deal on the cross on the cross of Jesus Christ. I was crucified with whom? I was crucified. Well, what's the Bible? Look on your paper. I was crucified with whom? With Christ. You understand? So where's that perfect tense take you to? It takes you to the cross where he was crucified for us. How has that benefited me? When I believe the gospel of Christ, that he died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead, called the gospel, which the crucifixion is the key part of it, isn't it? If there's no death, there's no resurrection. So the whole key element there is my salvation is secured the moment I believe because it's secured in Christ. I don't have to keep it, you understand, to have it. I got it by grace. It stays by grace. I don't lose it because I'm not great grace or grateful. You understand that? That's the perfect tense. I was crucified with Christ. 
in the past with the results I remain crucified with Christ even today whether I'm whether I'm I'm willing to crucify my flesh or to fulfill it in my desires I still have been crucified with him my sins are a done deal I'm never going to be judged for my sins forget that foolishness Christ died the judgment of sin when you accept the the, the death of Christ on the cross, his burial and resurrection, your sins are done. They've been paid for. That Listen, when you confess your sin, it's not to get them paid for. It's to acknowledge they've already been paid for. This is not about your salvation. It's about your spirituality. We live in the new covenant day of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. When you go to carnality, it, sh it shuts the lights off. It, it shuts the operation down. When you confess your sins, the cleansing that worked on the cross, crucified with him, works again in your life. You got to stop living in confession of sin all the time and start living in the power dynamics of the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. You gratify your flesh, you come back and confess it because you know you can. That's not living victorious. You've got to learn to shut the shut it down over here and win over the flesh. See, that's walk in the spirit, not the flesh. That's Galatians 5, 16, 17. And listen, if you think you're growing in the in the Father, you're not growing if you're giving into the flesh. You're not growing. It you're going back to the you're, the dog is going back to the old ways. Going back to his vomit. Don't do that. Listen, it, listen, don't do that. I'm telling you, as your pastor, don't do that. It, nothing good comes from sin beneficial to the Christian life. Do you not understand that? So why would you think you could do anything in sin that God would approve of? I was talking to a couple the other day. Christians, no doubt about it. At least we had a good term for it when I was a kid growing up. We called it shacking up. And everybody knew that wasn't good. Now they call it cohabiting and living together and all kinds of foolishness. And they think that's beneficial. I said, we... You know, you don't need to go before a priest or a rabbi or whoever. You, <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, you don't have to do that to get married because you're already married. You do know that, don't you? In the sight of God, you're already married. You're already married. You think you're married just because it's done in the sight of man? Is that what you think marriage is about? I'm married because I was married in the sight of men? No, let me tell you. You're married in the sight of, and let me tell you what it is. When, when every, two people tell you you love each other and you consummate it, you're married. So you might as well go ahead and call it legal. used to be frowned upon my society my society I was raised with it was frowned upon now it's not nobody even barks or, or or says anything to people living together not even within the family they don't want to run them off where are you going to run them to they're already in sin where are you going to run them to hey well they didn't agree with me what a shock here's a Here's point three. One thing that always interests me about this subject that we're in Hebrews 11 and 12. One thing that always interested me was the people the writer picked. You know, I write, I write and teach a great deal. If I was going to write that chapter, that had been a, a bugger boo to do, right? Think of all the great people. 
I don't know. So that's always intrigued me. So I've spent a lot of time studying the choice of people he picked. And I discovered something really interesting because of that interest. I want to share that with you if you don't mind. The people he picked out of Hebrews 11.4 through 32 by name. I found it interesting and I grouped them in four groupings. And it helped me see who he picked and how he picked them. For example, in Hebrews 11, 4 through 7, he picked Abel, Enoch, and Noah. That's the antediluvian period. I went, oh, isn't that interesting? And he picked Abel. He didn't pick Seth. That was interesting to me, too. Yeah, so he's looking at certain people living a certain lifestyle that has testimony for God in the world. Come on now. Now does Abel make sense? Uh, it does. But see, when I saw him start with Abel, I went, whoa, wait a minute. Everybody else started with Seth, didn't they? If you look at, if you look at Luke, the third chapter, in the genealogy of Christ, they, it starts Adam, Seth. So I found that interesting. I go, oh, well... He's got something in mind. Well, of course he has. It's Hebrews 11.1. 1. I found that. Then I went, whoa, I think, I think I might be onto something here. And so I looked at the second group, Hebrews 11, 8 through 22. I found he talked about Abraham four times by faith. He talked about Sarah, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, we call that the patriarch period. I found that to be interesting. And he started with Abraham. Ding, ding. That's the Abrahamic covenant business. Then I saw something interesting. Now he goes Jewish. The Jewish, he goes Jewish. He shows the exodus and conquest period. In Hebrews 11, 30, uh, 23, 31, he goes Moses three times, the Israelites two times, and Rahab. We got two women in the presbyteros. Then he does something interesting in verse 32 through 38. He goes into the Jewish period because he's talking about Old Covenant. He goes to the Jewish period. He talks about judges, kings, and prophets. And he lists them, Gideon, Barak, Samson, you know, the group. And then he, 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 he puts a tagline in there, and the women. I think somewhere around there, like verse 35, if I remember. And the women. Boy, there were a lot of heroes in the women line and the women. So I found it kind of interesting, for, at least for me. I found four groupings, and I found that to be very interesting on the faith cycle. And he's picking, guys, he's picking people who live their life by the faith cycle. Faith comes by hearing, believing, applying, completing, and it became a lifestyle. And that became a witness to the world of Christ. And the divine plan of God keeps moving throughout human history. Another thing of interest to me, you see why it takes me so long to study. Another thing, I just get curious about everything. I'm by nature a curious person. Another thing of interest was that the writer would break from what he was talking about and give a general doctrinal principle, that should be principle, a, a general doctrinal principle. I don't even, whatever, that, that doesn't spell anything. A general doctrinal principle of living by faith. Now, now pay attention to me because this gets really interesting, at least to me. All right? 
since I'm the teacher, I get this. Look, in the antediluvian period, and this is real, now I, I want you to have your Bibles in a moment. In the antediluvian period, he broke and he gave you 11.6. So let's take a look at that. He broke and gave you 11.6. You know, he, in that period, he goes Abel, Enoch, Noah. But he breaks. In verse 6, he breaks and he gives you a general principle about the faith cycle. He says, and without faith, it is impossible. And people quote these breaks, by the way. The breaks that he takes in this stuff, people quote this stuff all the time. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, God, for he... For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And then he goes back. Then he, then he goes back by faith Noah. Do you see that? Okay. Now watch. He's going to do this as a system. Now let's, he's going to do it in the patriarch period, Hebrews 11. He's going to do it again in Hebrews 11. Uh, 13. Watch 13 through 16. He, he's, he's, he's into Abraham, Abraham up there in, in verse 8, Abraham, and then he goes by faith, he, Abraham uh, looking, then by faith, Sarah, right? And, 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 and then he talks about the, the covenant. And then in verse 13, he takes a break from that. He goes, all these died, all these died. Now he's including everybody he's talked about. He's talked about all the people that he's talked about up to now. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. In other words, the inner eye, the eye of the spiritual side of being able to see something. From a distance, prophetic, from a distance, prophetic. And having confessed that there were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. Another one somewhere other than earth. And indeed, if they have been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But that's not what they were thinking. Abraham wasn't thinking about going back to Ur. Sarah wasn't thinking about going back to Ur. But as it is, they desired a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Another prophetic promise look of those who walk by faith. If you walk by faith, you will one day walk by sight. You walk by faith on earth so that you can walk by sight in heaven. Do you understand that? He broke. He broke and did a little doctrinal idea of how important it is to walk by the faith cycle. The faith cycle is the dynamics of your life. See that? Then, in the, in the Jewish period, he comes to wrapping this all up in verse 38. Watch what he does in 38. He makes a general idea. He says, men of whom the world, now he's talking about everybody that, uh, everybody of the old covenant who chose to walk by faith and not by sight and bore testimony of children of light to God's witness. Men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts, in mountains, in caves, holes in the ground. Right? And then he goes on, and all these have gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised. And he comes back to that. He comes back to that. And so in verse 38, he ends the list before giving a final principle of the faith cycle. 
Okay? Point four. Then the writer of Hebrews closes Hebrews chapter 11 with a final doctrinal principle of the faith cycle. Watch this now. Watch who he addresses. To new covenant believers of the importance of walking by faith. By walking by the faith cycle. Watch this. Watch this verse 39 and 40. All of these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because. There's a big because. This, you say to me, well, Rod, why, did, why, didn't the, he, why didn't they get what was promised? Because. Because God had provided something better for us. Who's the us? Tell me, tell me who us is. New Covenant believers who should be encouraged to live a lifestyle of the faith cycle. Live a, live a, a, a life for Christ. For me to live is whom? And to die is? Therefore, whether we live or die, should be all about Christ. Shouldn't be about us. Because God has provided something better for us. Please tell me you know that you're better off being a new covenant believer than an old covenant person. I mean, there is no comparison. We have everything. We have a better covenant, a better priesthood, better, 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 better. Hebrews, the, the chapter 8, 9, and 10, before we got to 11, told you it's all that. In fact, all, all the first 10 chapters of Hebrews tell you, you are, you're better off than anybody ever, 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 Right? My goodness, people, yeah, we've studied this stuff till we're blue in the face. Orange and blue or red and white, just how you do it. Uh, was that having to do with uh, their dispensation? That they were like promised the Messiah? The we're about Messiah. to do it, aren't we? You're jumping on I'm my sorry. You're jumping on my parade. Because God had provided something better for us, New Covenant believers, so that apart from uh, last one, this one, so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect or complete. In us, they're made complete. In the church age, they're made complete. They're made complete by us and our faith, our walk, our walk for faith, and the New Covenant fulfills their bringing that whole faith system to us, when we embrace it, that system is fulfilled. That whole existence of bringing us the plan of God, the whole system that operates by the faith cycle, then that thing is completed with us. Do you understand that? You know, if you was a runner, and, and it, it would be the baton has been passed off to you. You've seen them racing a baton. I got halfway through it, and I thought, if you don't know a baton in a race, that, pair, that idea is just non-existence. And I looked in some people's face, and I thought, I don't think that was a good illustration. So in verse 39 and 40, he lays that out. So the question would be, what was the promise that they did not receive while living by means of the faith cycle. Second, what was promised that would perfect or complete their living by faith? Third, what was promised that was beyond all of those who had gained approval through the faith cycle? The answer is in point five. The answer to these two questions that Pam already had answered for us and stole my number five from me, which is a wonderful thing because it shows maturity. The answer to these questions is the historical coming of the messianic seed called Jesus Christ. Matthew 1 through 17, Luke 3, 23 through 38. It is what we call the incarnation of Jesus Christ. 
the incarnation of the Son of God. We know this, for example, in Genesis, the third chapter 15, the seed of the woman is the Adamic covenant. He's going to fulfill that. We know that the seed of Abraham and Sarah of Genesis 17, 15, and 16, and verse 21, was the Abrahamic covenant that he's going to fulfill. We know that he was the seed of David, of 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 16, and Luke 1, 32, 33. He is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Now we're down to our period of life, the seed of the Virgin Mary, the in actual incarnation, and the and the start of a new covenant concept. Luke 1, 33, 30, uh, 34, 35, Matthew 1, 29, brought out in Hebrews 9, 15, when Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, a mediator of the new covenant. So, Paul says in Galatians, the third chapter, verse 16, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He, he does not say, and to seeds, plural, but rather he says seed referring to one. Watch what he says now. And to our seed. That is Christ. Notice that? Our seed. In Galatians 4.4, 4, the incarnation. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That's who we are. We are these people of the new covenant. And yet we're told that we bring their whole ministry alive when we walk by faith in the, in the new covenant which is all about Christ and him coming again. It, it brings that whole idea to fulfillment in us when we reach back and take the baton of walking by faith. That's a marvelous concept. And I thank you for it. Thank you for coming tonight. So what, what have we learned tonight for those who are visiting with on the Internet? We have learned the faith cycle. You need to stay with us on Wednesday night as we take, uh, as we deal with this in a greater way because the baton, is, the baton has been passed on to us by all of these wonderful old covenant people who built a life out of this concept for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. How do I live that life in Christ? I, will, I live it by the faith cycle. And learning that... Uh, is a marvelous idea. And we bring their whole life and ministry to fulfillment. We're an extension, aren't we? We're an extension of that. We're an extension of the old covenant as new covenant people. It's a wonderful idea. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way to study with us on the, the doctrine of gained approval. And we've really, we've really tried to break that thing down uh, I didn't get to a section tonight. I hope they will go back and study it, Father. Is that every time he broke a link between somebody in a period of time, like he did, we had Abel, we had Enoch and Noah. Between Enoch and Noah, Father, the writer broke and gave a biblical principle he did it every time. I didn't get to that tonight, Father. I hope they'll go and study that. I'll take a look at my paper a moment, make sure I put that down. If not, I'll cover it next time. What an interesting idea. These became really key, key doctrines of the faith cycle, uh, doctrinal principles. And I hope our people will gather that because they are still in stride in our life today. They're still important. The concepts are, the principles are very important to the faith cycle. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.